We know through science that life began as simple strings of protein that could make copies of themselves. From there it developed into single-celled life forms, then into algae and seaweed and snails and fish. Eventually it made the jump onto land as lizards and snakes and ferns and trees and dinosaurs. Finally, it took the form of mammals, furry creatures with relatively large brains. When one group of mammals, the primates, started using their front feet as hands, brain development took off. The animals started getting smarter and more clever and more strategic until at some point their excess brain capacity became so great that it tipped some cosmic scale. At some point they woke up, became self-aware. At some point they started asking themselves the question that separates humans from animals. Why? Why does rain fall? Why do plants grow? Why does the sun cross the sky? And most of all, why am I here? Why do I exist? A million years later, we know why rain falls, why plants grow, why the sun crosses the sky. Through scientific processes, we know about things so tiny we can't see them, and things so big we can't imagine them. When it comes to people, science can tell us why they are tall or short, dark or fair, blue-eyed or brown. In fact, a researcher could take a bit of your blood, analyze your DNA, and say why you are the unique physical creature you are. But we still can't answer the big why. Why are we here? What is our purpose? What is the meaning of life? Religion tries to fill that gap, telling us that we're here because God put us here and that our purpose is to obey. But why does God want something to simply obey? It kind of puts him in a category with some of history's most hated people. Besides, fish obey God, don't they? God says, swim, eat, lay eggs, die and they swim, eat, lay eggs, and die. Why bother creating humans? We are, after all, quite a handful. Emanuel Swedenborg offers a one-word answer to those questions. The word is love. God put us here because of love. God wants us to obey because of love. And because of love, obedient fish just aren't good enough. Right, you'll probably say, God loves us, that's not new. But it's more than just God loves us. Swedenborg, an 18th century theologian, said that God is actually love itself. That means God is all love and all love is God. And the love of God is the actual underlying substance of reality. So the world, all the universe in all its vast brilliance, is an expression of God's love. Now, when you love, how does that work? Do you just walk around being love? Well, we can try. But for love to come into bloom, we need an object. We need something to love. And while we might love old cars or gourmet food or obedient fish, love's bloom only opens all the way for one thing, the love of other people. Why? Did you ever think about that? Why is it that loving other people is deeper, more satisfying, more completing than loving, say, your dog or your house or your best set of golf clubs? The answer is that other people can accept your love or not can appreciate your love or not, and can love you back or not. So when they accept your love and return it, it means something. It brings you together, lets you share, makes you in some ways one. And finally, through that oneness, you can bring them joy, make them happy, care for them. You can't have that kind of oneness with golf clubs, and even your dog doesn't really have a choice in the matter. Love, according to Swedenborg, works the same way when it flows directly from the source. Love in the soul of God wants an object, just as it does in our souls. Love in the soul of God wants to be accepted and appreciated, just as it does in our souls. And just as it does for us, love in the soul of God desires the oneness that comes when someone, in freedom, takes it in and returns it in kind. So why are we here? We are here to be loved. We are here to love. We are here to be conjoined with God, to feel God's love flowing through us into everything we do. We are here to be happy in the pure joy that comes from loving and being loved in fullness. So how do we do that? And why do so many people seem to do it so poorly? Well, think about the idea that God is all love and all love is God. That means when we feel love and share love, we are really sharing the presence of God inside ourselves. And if we don't open ourselves and let God fill us, we won't have love to share. In a way, we are like this glass, with the flow of God's love being like this water. 
If we turn away, no amount of water will cause the glass to be filled, and someone inside the glass would not feel the water, would not see the water, might not believe the water is real. But if we listen to what God teaches us about how to stop hurting each other and start being kind, how to think of what other people need and want, it's like beginning to turn the glass toward the water. As we practice those things, it's like turning the glass further. And when we commit to those things and open ourselves fully, we can be filled to overflowing with endless water to share with others. Sounds a little better than swimming, eating, laying eggs, and dying, doesn't it? So what is the meaning of life? Our whole purpose, our reason to exist, is so we can turn toward God and be filled to overflowing with love.